Well, has anyone who's recently turned on the television, driven through a suburban neighborhood, or simply streamed an online video can tell you that the election season of 2022 is fully upon us. It's that time of the year that we're continually bombarded by media campaigns, carefully designed to convince us, the general public, that one particular candidate is the best. They're, they're better than the, the other for this position. They're, be they're the best person for the job. You should vote for so-and-so. Now, one component of the electoral races is that of the campaign promise, a proclamation of what a particular candidate will do, or in some cases will not do, if they become elected into office. These promises often reflect the political and social climates of the time, playing off the failures or misfortunes of those who are currently in office, suggesting that a drastic change in leadership is needed. You know, ultimately, these promises become the driving force or foundation of a, per, of a particular candidate's campaign message. You know, most notably or notable examples of campaign promises would include some of the following. The promise of better working conditions, higher wages or increased job opportunities. How about infrastructure improvements, better roads, better bridges, better power services? The promise of better management of government spending. I think we hear that quite a bit. Or in the case of our presidential candidates, the promise of national peace and prosperity. The promise of a better tomorrow. Now these, these promises often aid in the formation of a campaign slogan. Something that reflects what they're promising. My current President Joe Biden, his 2020 campaign, our best days are still, or they still lie ahead, or build back better. President Donald Trump's slogan, make America great again, or promises made, promises kept. Then if we go back a, a few years to 2008, Barack Obama, or President Barack Obama's slogan, a change we can believe in. You know, all these slogans implying that a serious change was needed to improve the lives of those living in the country, that a change in leadership was needed for this to happen. Now, interestingly enough, today, the Feast of Trumpets pictures a future change in leadership, not on a local or a national level, but a change that will take place on a global scale. And with that change, the fulfillment of promises made, one of those being that of the first resurrection, a change from physical to spiritual to those with God's spirit dwelling within them, resurrected to serve alongside Jesus Christ at his return. Well, this ultimately begs the question, you know, given our experience with human governments and human leadership here on earth, you know, the broken promises, the conflicts of interest, the abuses of power, are these promises of hope prosperity and change given to us by God, something that we can truly believe in. Well, brethren, for the time remaining this afternoon, let's consider this idea of change as it relates to the Feast of Trumpets. Let's take a look at our Bibles and see, you know, is there truly a change that we as God's chosen people can believe in? The title for today's sermonette or this afternoon's sermonette is the Feast of Trumpets, a change we can believe in. Again, it's Feast of Trumpets, a change we can believe in. Now, if, if we follow these campaign promises you know, of change through, you know, past the elections, past the celebrations, all the ceremonies, and into the heart of an elected official's term of office, what do we find? Well, we find a, a mixture of things. We find a, a few kept promises, those Low, bits of low-hanging fruit that were pretty much in play before, when they came into office. And at times, we, we find just a simple failure to follow through on what was being said. Then a lot of compromise. And what good has that gained us? Do we have lasting peace? Do we have sustained prosperity? Do we have equality for all? As President Ronald Reagan 
asked in his 1980 elect election campaign a question that is still applicable today. So are you better off than you were four years ago? Well, what if we expand that out? How about 30 years ago? Are we better off than we were 30 years ago? What about 1,000 years ago? If you would, take your Bibles, please, and, and begin turning to Isaiah chapter 24. You know, it doesn't take much looking around to see, you know, the result of man's rulership. And I'm not just referencing the United States here, but looking at the world as a whole. You know, much of the world is facing record inflation. I, it, I, I saw a little news bulletin pop up on my phone this morning about Britain's, the value of their pound is now $1.07 to the US dollar, where typically, for as long as I can remember, it's like $1.40, $1.50. I mean, that's how bad things are getting. Many countries are engulfed in war or teetering on the edge of it. Health epidemics abound us, record droughts affecting parts of Europe and the Western United States, widespread poverty, and there's an ever-growing lack of respect for authority among our younger generations. You now we as a people, you know, we're slowly destroying everything that we touch. And it's called out in Isaiah 24. So let's begin reading in verse 4 of Isaiah 24. This is Isaiah 24, beginning in verse 4. The earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants because... They have transgressed the laws, they have changed the ordinance, they have broken the, ever, the everlasting covenant. You know, since the Garden of Eden, when man decided to follow his own path, humanity has been making promises of change. You know, there's a better way that we can do this. How about this? Let's do this instead. But in reality, the only thing that we're really good at is living a way of life that leads to destruction. You know, our track record, if we look back, it proves this. It's awful. But what about God? Can we be certain, without a doubt, that he will follow through on what he's promised? Again, can we believe in the promises that have been given to us? Can we believe in the promise of the resurrection to eternal life? You would begin to start... Or, if you could, start turning to Hebrews 6. Um, it's here that we read about the fulfillment of God's promises that were given to Abraham and how that fulfillment gives us hope. It gives us comfort and, and trust and that God will do the same for us. So that's Hebrews 6. We'll begin reading in verse 13. And it's Hebrews 6, beginning in verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater... He swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, that being Abraham, he obtained the promise, you know, the birth of his son Isaac, and the family lines that developed from there, and the, the immense blessings that were given to him. We continue reading, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. You know, like Abraham, we've been given a promise of greatness, a promise of a hopeful future, the opportunity to become members of God's family. And because God has promised this and he's confirmed it by an oath, well, we too can find solace and peace of mind that these promises that have been given will be fulfilled because God doesn't lie. He doesn't change. Now, indeed, this day truly looks forward to a better future, a future where man's leadership is replaced by that of God's through his son, Jesus Christ. And that change will come, uh, and, and with that change will come the fulfillment of promises made, a thousand, or, oh, made thousands of years ago from the foundation of the world. Promises of reform, promises of peace, and again, promises of prosperity. Additionally, to those who have committed their lives to God, who have repented of their sins, 
and have received God's Spirit through baptism to those he's promised sonship, you know, resurrection from physical to spiritual. Now, at this point, it's important to note that for these promises to be fulfilled, it requires something from us. It requires action on our part. It's tr true change isn't one-sided. Long story short, we have to choose sides. If you would, please turn with me for one final scripture, and that's found in Romans 8. It's Romans 8. We'll begin reading in verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit in him, of him who raised Jesus from the, dwe the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit that, who dwells in you. And then dropping down to verse 16. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that that we also, or that we may also be glorified together. So, you know, as we've read here, we, we re we've received a promise of sonship, a chance to become spirit beings, children of God. But this requires real change on our part, something more than simply casting a ballot or, or making a financial donation. We have to commit ourselves to God and his way of life. We have to, we have to live it. You know, we have to put away the ways of the flesh and then live God's way of truth. Brethren, we've seen the result and, and live the result of man's rulership here on earth. We know that it leads to nothing but death and destruction. We also know that God's promises to us are true and will be kept to those who are found faithful upon Christ's return. You know, as baptized members of the Church of God, we have a hope and faith in this coming change that this day pictures, the return and establishment of our Lord Jesus Christ as King and ruler over all the earth, and at his return, the resurrection of the saints on the last trumpet. Today, the Feast of Trumpets is truly a day that we can believe in. And Godspeed that day.